unimportant. Amen? One of the jobs, I mean, you might think, uh, I, I know Adam and Sweaty this past week, man, they took the pressure washer, and they're just out there pressure washing. He said, man, I don't want that kind of job. You know what? That makes a huge difference. It does. Matthew cuts the grass every week. That makes a huge difference. Martin Kim cleaned the church. That makes a huge difference. Those who lead singing, those who play instruments, all of it working together. That doesn't mean if you're in one particular job, you'll be in there forever. You, you may move around, but we want to inv- invite everyone to be a part. I'm excited about it. Tonight, God helping me, uh, after we dismiss the classes in just a moment, uh, I'm going to direct your attention to the screen. I'm going to have a short, short video, and then I want to share a message about the lost sheep. Let me dismiss our classes right now. God bless you as you go to your classes. Can we give our workers a hand that work on Wednesday night and on Sundays? Amen. God bless you as you go. All we like sheep have gone astray. All have sinned. All have fallen short. All are lost. The wages, the consequence of sin, is death. Eternal separation from God. But God demonstrates his love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Since we have been made right through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after them, which is lost? Now, this is important. You need to understand this. Saying, um, Can we back up one screen? Oh, I'm sorry, there it is. And we go after the one which is what? Lost. Until he finds it, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he's coming home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have, uh, I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say to you that likewise there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, I want to, in just a moment, we're going to pray. But I want to go ahead right now and just put to rest some rumors uh, as far as what it means to be reaching out to lost people. I've had people tell me over the years, and I've been pastoring 20-plus years, 23 years, in ministry about 26, and I've had people talk to me before about lost sheep. And they take the Scripture out of context And they say that a pastor ought to chase everybody who leaves a church. They're one of the lost sheep. Well, Jesus was talking about people who are genuinely lost in sin and do not know Jesus. Now, it's a different story if you've got somebody that's just being bullheaded or hardheaded, know Jesus, and just don't want to be part of the sheepfold. Y'all hear me? Jesus said he left the 90 and 9 to go find a lost sheep. Not someone in rebellion. Are y'all hearing me? So I just want to clear that up because the word of the Lord is clear. We're talking about lost sheep. Now, granted, there are those who go out in rebellion and they end up getting lost because the, the backslider in his heart is filled with his or her own ways. And I've been there. And you've probably been there, right? 
So it's easy. How many of you thought you had your way worked out and looked around and you was lost? Huh? You would never tell nobody, especially if you're a male, that you were lost. But nonetheless, nonetheless, you was, uh, like the old fellow said up in the hill, I was powerful confused for a few days. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just love you. We thank you. I'm asking you to touch us tonight, God, that we might understand what it means to reach out to the lost in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Um, Pastor David Cooper tells a story of when he took his family on vacation. And while he was vacationing, he and his wife and his children were building a sandcastle. It wasn't too long ago. I was down on the beach and I saw some tremendous artwork that somebody put must have been hours into, they had a whole lot of time on their hands because they made some, some, uh, some, some awesome sand sculptures, if you want to call it that. But as Pastor Cooper and his family was vacationing and building a sand castle, um, his youngest daughter that was five years old decided to go to the edge of the seashore to find some shells. And so you know how it is, especially if there's a lot of people on the beach, when you leave your little party that you're... At, and you go down there to find some shells, and this shell is not the one that I want. No, it's this one, and, and it's that one, and no, it's the other one, and the, there's the one way over there. Next thing you know, you look up and say, where's Daddy? And you can't find him. And so you just start walking further and further and further. You understand. You get the picture, right? So while doing this, she lost sight of her Daddy. And then she panicked and began walking down the beach looking for him. The problem is he was back this way. Now, you can understand the panic that must have took place uh, with mom and dad there. Uh, there's no greater experience in the world than to think that a child is lost, right? I'll never forget Statesboro, Georgia. We were at Food Max. A.J. was a little bitty tot. I'm talking about kind of like Heidi right now or Micah. And... Carly was pushing the little umbrella stroller, right? Adam was walking along, and uh, Carly's pushing her little brother. And uh, me and Kelly are shopping, and we're putting things in the buggy and whatever. Well, Carly got tired of pushing him. And so as the aisle is going like this, she just put him neatly right behind the display, just tucked him right in there, and left him and walked on. Well, we get on the next aisle... And we look around, and there's Carly walking along, and there's no stroller, there's no H.A. Hey, where's your brother? Where's H.A.? I don't know. And, you know, uh, we flipped out. Are you with me? I bolted to the front door. I'm talking about to the parking lot. I went. They must have thought I had ten turkeys under each arm or something. And, man, I was gone to the parking lot thinking somebody has heisted my little boy and trying to get away. So I was gone to the parking lot. Kelly's gone crazy. And, uh... You know, we're looking and looking, and uh, I go to the parking lot. I see nothing in the parking lot. I'm, you know, and I come back into the store, and by now everybody's looking at me like, man, he has lost his mind. I'm scanning frantically up and down the aisles. And when I get all the way back over to the back of the store, the dairy aisle, there's a little old lady. She says, honey, where's your mommy? <laughs> and you feel like a fool, and at the same time you're, extremely glad that he's all right. You try to explain that your daughter was pushing him, but you know it's no excuse. You're just a sorry mom or dad. You lost your child. But, uh, so I could take all of that. But, but that feeling, I'll never forget the two or three minutes where there was just such emotions. In, I mean, such turmoil in my... You know, I saw so many pictures of everything that's bad. Y'all hear me? So... I understand that. Now, the baby, AJ, had no idea. He was sleeping right on, you know. And, uh, but that feeling of being lost. But this five-year-old girl that's on the beach, could you imagine her looking up and she don't find mom and daddy? She can't see mom and daddy. And then you imagine mom and dad as they realize, hey, uh, she's gone. I know what that feels like. And it is absolutely uh, uh, excruciating. So the difference between this five-year-old daughter and many people is that she knew she was lost. I talk to people all the time. They're lost and don't even know it. They lost and will tell you squarely. They know exactly where they're headed, what they're doing. They'll tell you they're right with the Lord. 
Um, and so many people today, I mean, for instance, right now, um, at Christmas, the world asks, who is Jesus and why did he come to the earth? And Jesus said, I come to seek and to save those who are lost. You see, uh, that comes to us in Luke 19 and 10. And then Romans 3 and 23 lets us know that we are all, we are lost spiritually for all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, we can be lost for a number of reasons. We can be lost from our purpose, like the Apostle Peter, who denied the Lord and forsook his ministry. Or we can just sort of drift away, uh, get cold. Like, like he told the church, you remember the church in Ephes Ephesus, the one that he said, I have somewhat against you because you've lost your first love. You're not quite where you used to be. Or maybe we've even gone to the point of the Laodicean church who thought that they were all right. They thought everything was okay. But the Bible said they didn't realize that they were poor and wretched and miserable and, and blind. And they had need that the Lord would touch them with ISAB that they might see their condition. Did you know that the prodigal son when he left home, and we talked about this just a few weeks ago, about the road to, uh, the road to or a rebellion is the road to ruin. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Rebellion is the road to ruin. You remember that? And, and the Bible said the prodigal son came to himself where? Where? In the hog pen. So he was lost and didn't even realize he was lost until one day the light bulb come on. He said, wow, I could have had a V8. No, maybe he didn't say that, but he said, I could have been back home, right? I should have been back home. So then we, we could be lost like that. We could be lost in grief. We could be lost in depression where we're having such mental turmoil in our mind. And, and that's very real, by the way. We could be lost in confusion and not knowing where to go in life. We could be lost with this sense of being helpless that I can't never do anything right. I can't never fix anything. So Jesus tells us of three uh, precious and valuable items that were lost. And I think you know they come out of Luke chapter 15. And they were lost for different reasons. First, you know, there, there, was, uh, there was a sheep that was lost. And it was lost because of its own foolishness. You with me? And then there was a coin that was lost. And that coin was lost because of someone's carelessness. And then there was a boy that was lost. And he was lost because of his own deliberate choice. We talked about it. His own rebellion. So three things were lost. The coin was lost through carelessness. The sheep was lost through uh, its, its foolishness. And then the boy because of his own deliberate choice. And so tonight, I just want to talk about the sheep. I love to talk about all of these because that's why Jesus come is to seek and to save the lost. And I love to talk about lost things because I was lost but now I'm found. Amen. I was blind, but now I see. So I understand that. I get it. I, as far as, uh, I, I know where I came from. And that, thank God I know where I'm headed. So let me give you, if I may, the situation uh, that is on hand today with this lost sheep. First of all, Jesus addressed two important issues in this story. He said, in fact, in Matthew 10, or 9, 10 through 13, and then we're going to look at these, so we'll have those ready. Number one, he criticized the religious leaders. Here's the situation. Jesus associated with sinners and, as they called him. Notice this. He says in Matthew 9, through 13, 9, 10 through 13. Now, it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the uh, house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, notice this, they didn't just come out and ask him, but they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Uh, now, to me, they could have just as easily asked him. But, and uh, when Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Can I tell you something? Listen to me now. 
the self-righteous people, who the Pharisees of that day, you're not going to change their mind anyway. You know why? They should have wrote the book because they know it all, or they thought they knew it all. And Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise see the kingdom of heaven. Right? It's hard to talk to a self-righteous person. It's hard to talk to someone who knows everything. And, and you know, you might not want to look at your neighbor right there, but nonetheless, in, in, in verse, or chapter 11 and verse 19, notice what he says here. In 11 and 19, he said, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Listen, he, Jesus come trying to reach the lost, and the religious people hated him for it. Now listen to me, because you're involved in trying to reach the lost. You're going to get involved in getting your hands dirty with some of these people of the world trying to win them, trying to get them off of drugs and alcohol, trying to get them out of uh, the lifestyle that they're in. And once they associate you with them, they're going to say, Look at you, you friend of sinners and wine, bibber and publican. They won't use those King James terms or even the new King James terms, but that's what they mean. I want to tell you a, a good illustration. I was with, at Grace Point Church with Pastor Chris Doherty this past week on Sunday morning. And the guy who welcomed me, who's the head usher now, <laughs> I walk in and this cat's got an you know, earbud in his ear and he's talking to about eight parking lot attendants. He's got VIP passes with people coming in. Listen, this cat was dealing drugs 18 months ago. He ran an underground Texas Hold'em tournament where they were gambling and doing all kind of stuff. Pastor Chris had a burden for him. He said to somebody, I'm going to go down there and win him to the Lord. They said, you are crazy in the head. You ain't going to win him to the Lord. He said, I'm going to win him. Chris went down and played cards with him a few times. I can see that hitting Twitter and Facebook now. Oh, my goodness. But let me tell you something. Regardless of what they said about him, he went in there, and after a few trips, I'm not sure how he got him eventually. They said he'd never come to the church. He come to the church. The woman that he was with, that he was doing coke and drugs and all kind of other stuff and selling stuff and underworld stuff and illegal gambling and all the things he was doing, now is his wife and sits beside him on the front row at the church. Not only him, but some of their best friends who was gambling and drinking and drugging with them, they're in the church also. And guess what? They're parking cars. And, and they're running video equipment in the back. The guys that used to be gambling and carrying on and doing all these things. A year and a half ago, now they're in the church. And I pictures of them being baptized in water. Amen? God saving them and their brother and their mama and daddy and uncles. That's what the Lord said when I come to seek the lost. I know somebody will give me a biblical example of that. I think I will. The Philippian jailer who had incarcerated or was holding incarcerated Paul and Silas when the earthquake took place and they were delivered out of the jail, he took his sword and was going to fall on it and Paul said, don't do yourself no harm. And the same jailer that just not a few moments ago or hours whipped them and beat them is now taking them to his house washing the stripes on their backs and their legs introduces them to his wife and the children and the Bible said the whole house got saved <laughs> so but let me let me warn you let me warn you you reach out and really try to help somebody get off of an addiction be seen with them be seen with them have them start coming sitting beside you at church, and I'll guarantee you the world and a lot of the church. You see, so, sometimes the world ain't the worst critic. Sometimes the church is. Sometimes the church don't even want to give people a chance, and the Lord says, I came to seek and to save them. You are already saved, but get them here. Just get them here. Listen, we don't have to clean them. God said that we're to catch the fish. He'll clean them. That was the part I hated about fishing anyway, Brian. The bad thing is that they're biting like cats and dogs. I mean, they're just biting crazy. You've got to clean them when you get home. Huh? I didn't like cleaning fish. So, listen, if you catch them in the world, we get them to the house of God. Let's, just, let's let God clean them up. Amen? Let's let God clean them up. Now, so... I like this word. He says, uh, uh, in the New King James, puts, he says, he receives. You see, we must never grow calloused like the Pharisees were. 
Can we look at John 6 and 37? See what that says, John 6 and 37. Um, the Pharisees were, they say, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. That means that person comes, I don't care what condition they're in, Jesus said, I'm not going to cast them out. But listen, we can never get calloused like the Pharisees and think, well, you can't come into our church, this brand new facility, and smell it up with your alcohol breath. Then why are we build it? Huh? Huh? If we can't bring the halt, the drunk, the lame, the lazy, if we can't have them have an encounter with the Lord at the altar and watch the precious blood of Jesus set them free, then why Bill? I'm telling you, it, it's not about parades and institutions. Amen? It, it, it's about this pilgrimage that we're on where the Lord Jesus Christ has come to set free and come to deliver those who are lost and come to live in them. And you know the beauty of it, friend? To me, the beauty of it is to see somebody. who. And, and, and let me tell you something. One of the, the greatest highs you'll ever have in your life is when you come in this church and you see somebody that you had witnessed to. Maybe you were on the research team that morning and pastor was going to preach on the resurrection. Maybe you were one of the ones that submitted an illustration, you know, and said maybe, you know, I'll get ever how many of them, but maybe I used yours that morning. Huh? And it was after that illustration, someone began to weep into their hands and come to an altar. All of a sudden, you feel like I had a part. I had something to do. It was my research. It was my whatever it was that I have done. Whatever team you served on, maybe you carried somebody a loaf of bread and they showed back up. And the next time they showed up, they gave their heart to the Lord. And you realize I had a part in this. That's one of the greatest feelings you'll ever have in your life. I urge you to give yourself those opportunities. Now, I, I need to move on. So, uh, he, had, he criticized the religious leaders. He clarified the nature of God and the nature of salvation. You see, do people accidentally come to Christ? Uh, no. God searches us out. We see Jesus looking for us. He said uh, the Father draws us and the Holy Spirit draws us. Are you all with me? We don't just get up one day and say, well, I'm going to go to church today. I have guests come out and say, well, well, what brought you? They say, well, I saw your sign, uh, saw, uh, saw you on the Internet, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what? That, that's a true statement. They saw it on the Internet. Uh, maybe a friend invited them. But how many times have you drove by a sign? And how many times have you been invited until the Spirit begins to work in cooperation with what people are doing? And then the Spirit of the Lord reaches out to them and they show up. You see, uh, now, so there's the, that's the situation with the sheep. Now, I, I want to look at the sheep himself. Uh, you know what? In the sheep himself, notice Isaiah 53 and 6. Isaiah 53 and 6 tells me that all we like sheep have what? We've gone astray. We did what? We, every one to his own way. And the Lord... Laid on who? That's capital H. Jesus laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've all decided to do our own thing at times. Don't need Jesus. Don't need the church. Don't need the pastor. Don't need the headache. Don't need this. Don't need that, right? All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. And God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Every one of us. So listen, uh, we have gone astray. Now, why? How? Let me just say it like this. Some were just senseless. Sheep wandered off. You see, a sheep, uh, you saw them, uh, there he is, and they're just senseless. They wander off, don't know no better. Um, they just wander around. Perhaps they got like the young girl, distracted by finding something else. Maybe they saw some green grass and maybe another place, and they just, you know, they're just doing their thing. Notice with me Proverbs 16 and 25. And in Proverbs 16 and 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in the way of death. 
Listen, this sheep is senseless. Now, I want you to notice something else about this lamb. They are also defenseless. You with me? Away from their shepherd, they're defenseless. Now, you've you got to understand it. See, sheep are unable to protect themselves from the danger. Uh, they are also directionless. It brings the feeling, uh, this brings feelings of emptiness and meaningless, uh, or meaninglessness, if you will. We need the law of God to guide us because we cannot depend on our own direction. We're like them sheep, directionless. We don't, we don't know which way to go. Huh? Lord, I don't know where to go. And in fact, that, that was one of the prophecies, or one of the prayers in the Bible. They said, Lord, we got people fighting behind us. we got them fighting in front of us. They're on both sides. And the prophet said, Lord, we just don't know what to do. But our eyes are stayed on you. Huh? Listen, sheep need a shepherd to direct them. Now, uh, they are senseless. They are directionless. They are defenseless. They are helpless. Sheep are without provision. They cannot care for themselves, and they depend upon a shepherd. Now, I, I want to straighten that up because I, I know people are drawing the analogy between sheep and shepherd. Now, while there is a lot of uh, pictures that can be drawn and analogies can be made, uh, we as sheep, while, while a sheep like here, yes, they have to be absolutely provided for, that does not mean that we come and sit uh, you know, on the pews and say, okay, pastor, feed me a great message. I've already shoveled enough hay into this place. Y'all hear me? I poured enough corn into this place and sweet feed into this place. We ought to be strong enough to win the world ten times. Right? I mean, yes, we do feed, but if I'm sitting there we also must be self-feeders. We must study ourselves. We must feed ourselves. We must read the Bible for ourselves. We must pray for ourselves. We must get involved in furthering our discipleship with the Lord for ourselves. If you don't, you're never going to be a leader in the kingdom of God. You see, if you don't do those things, you'll always be on Sunday. You know, Micah, when he gets hungry, he'll let you know he's hungry. You know, he's chewing his fist in half, and he wants us to feed him. And you know what? For about a year, we're going to do that with the bottle. And then, you know, it ain't going to be long. He's going to grab a spoon. Huh? It ain't going to be too much longer than that. I'm going to have him at Longhorn and be cutting up a steak for him. Right? That's right. Because he's going to learn to eat on his own. He's going to learn to feed himself. We carry him around right now, and we love that because he can't walk. But there's going to come a day when he's going to walk. There's going to come a day he's going to play them drums and the piano. Right? There's come a day that God's going to use him. He's going to do some great and mighty things. But right now, he's a baby. I've got to help him along. Right? And that's the way it is when we win. You might win somebody that's 45 years old, and they are a baby in the Lord. You've got to talk to them like that. You've got to work with them like that. You don't expect a baby in the Lord all of a sudden to look like T.D. Jakes. I mean, you can't ever assume that they know everything there is to know. Did you know? I, listen. Most people, when it comes to the Bible, most of America is biblically illiterate. Right now, if you ask ten grade school students who Moses was, seven of them couldn't tell you. Are you hearing me? If you ask ten about David, seven couldn't tell you who David was when we speak of the Bible. Now, that, that might be a little bit better in the deep south here. But I'll guarantee you the average across this country, seven couldn't tell you. What that means is this. Used to, when we talked about uh, God, and, and when we talked about, even if you were talking to an atheist, they at least knew who the God was that they didn't believe in. <laughs> if we're not careful now, we'll find ourselves dealing with people that have no clue, no clue about the Bible whatsoever. Now, okay, let me move on. So we talked about the, uh, the situation, uh, the sheep. Now let's look at the shepherd. The shepherd is a portrait of God himself. Notice Psalm 23 with me real quick, and you could probably quote it. The Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, right? 
For thou art with me, thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me, and you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Right? You know what? My head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a picture of the greatest shepherd ever. So, uh, it's a portrait of God. No, well, I don't have time to read Ezekiel 34 because I know how, how deep uh, Brother Ezekiel can get. But um, nonetheless, let me just say this. The shepherd is this portrait of God. And now, God places, obviously, shepherds in our lives uh, to, to help us along. Uh, look at the shepherds in Israel in Jesus' time. They were on a low, low, low economic scale. They were often uh, uh, busy and could not practice. They could not, because of their job, be at all of the ritual prayers and so forth. But let me tell you something. Don't you find it interesting? Even though a shepherd, though they were very unclean by their standards, by the standards of that day, and they could not come to the ritual prayers and all the meetings that they should, do you find it interesting that when the Son of God was about to be born, that an angel made the, I mean, the breaking news didn't go to see an inner fox, it went to a shepherd. I think that's unique. I think it's amazing that God decided to do it that way. Interesting, the angel appears to the shepherds to announce the Messiah's arrival. So notice this. The shepherd had a close relationship with the sheep. The shepherd called the sheep by name. Um, sheep were kept. Listen, it's different than raising hogs. Has anybody ever raised hogs? Let me see your hand. Well, my, my grandparents on the farm there and then my uh, aunts and uncles, they, they raise hogs and whatever. And uh, you raise hogs to kill, right, or to sell. But you're raising them for the food, to slaughter them. If you raise livestock, you're raising them that they're going to one day be slaughtered and you're going to put beef in the freezer, right? Not so with the sheep. They were going to keep the sheep on and on and on and on and, and shear them, sell the wool, and grow some more and sell and, you know. So it's more like kind of the relationship with someone raising chickens. <laughs> it's a contribution. Uh, it, it's not total dedication. <laughs> Are you all with me? Uh, let me move on. So, so the sheep is going to be there, or the shepherd's going to be there, and he's going to look after them. They're kept for wool, not for slaughter. So the shepherd has them for years and years, and he is familiar with them. The shepherd had a distinctive voice. I find this neat as I was studying. Flocks could be distinguished because they knew their shepherd's voice. Did you know? You could even have um, a, a near herdsman, someone else, and their sheep over here, and then you could be over here, and I could be over there, and I could start calling my sheep, and guess what? They might be hanging out talking to some of the sheep over there, but they're going to come over here when they hear my voice, and they know it's the sound that I make when I feed them. They're coming to me. Huh? I remember watching my Uncle James. I'll never forget it. He began to, to, to call those cows and, uh, as we was taking hay down and opening hay and pouring it out or, or just throwing it out the back of the truck and just watching them come, you know, uh, across the fields. It's just amazing, you know. In fact, really and truly, sometimes he didn't have to make a sound. Once they heard that old truck moving, they knew what was about to happen. The shepherd walked in front of the sheep, in front instead of behind them, to lead and, and, and face the danger first. Protection and provision for the sheep was the shepherd's full responsibility. He led them out to pasture in the morning. He brought them home at night under his watchful eye as well. The shepherd was equipped with a staff and a rod. The shepherd was, uh, the, the staff was a long stick that was used to guide, now if we want to talk about analogies, to guide the sheep and even to prod them at times. Now, I remember taking hogs to the market. Now, we had what we called a hot shot. And y'all familiar with that? That's fun, man, when you get your cousin with it, right? <laughs> yeah, they don't forget it, and you don't either if they get you back. Well, I mean, it's a rod about so big, you got a button, and it'll light you up. It's got batteries in it. It's kind of like the modern-day taser, <laughs> except it's designed for cattle. 
And see, if you get uh, an animal that's just right in the gate and you got to shoot right here, he's got to walk up that chute to get in the truck, and he don't want to go, you just encourage him. Man, he'll burn out going up that chute. Right? Yeah. And so will your cousin. If you <laughs> so, so the rod was there and the staff was there. I, I, here's a cruel in that analogy, I suppose, but... You know, the rod, they, they would prod, and then the crook of that staff. You know, because I told you, sheep are senseless. Now, see, we, we're all, you know, we look at this shepherd-sheep deal, but all of us are sheep in the sense that I've got a shepherd as well. Y'all hearing me? We all do. But we, we're not careful. We do like a sheep does, and we go do our own thing, and we're senseless, and we're directionless, and we're careless. We walk edge, you know, eerily close to the edge. So that crook was there so a shepherd could reach out and grab around his neck and snatch him back. Y'all with me? Now let me tell you this. This, this is kind of, this is a tough one, but I won't share it with you anyway. If you look into antiquity, you can find where shepherds actually, if they had a sheep that would continue to go away and do his own thing and be wayward and get near danger, he would take that rod and smack that sheep's leg and break it and then would carry him for the next month or six weeks until his leg healed. Now that's kind of cold-hearted, man. Isn't that right? But you know what they say? That sheep will never, he will always be right near that shepherd from then on. He won't wander off far. You know why? He don't want another broke leg. I don't know if it's just such an allegiance after that or what. I'm just telling you what, what they tell us. So, uh, the rod was used as a weapon uh, to defend the sheep. Listen, the shepherd's job was to look after those sheep. The shepherd never one time wanted to hurt the sheep. You need to understand that. The shepherd loved the sheep. He wanted to keep the sheep. He did not want a wild animal. In fact, David was um, the greatest shepherd that we have record of. A lion came after his father's sheep and he killed him with his bare hand. Put his own life at peril and risk. A bear, same thing. Are you with me? So that's the shepherd is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And then, of course, we know the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, did lay down his life for the sheep. Now, let me talk to you about salvation and we'll tie this up. Salvation is the work of the good shepherd alone, not me. I've never saved anybody. I can point you to salvation. I can preach the gospel to you. I can give you the gospel in just a couple of minutes or three. And then it's up to you to accept the plan of salvation. But the sheep needs only to stop running and submit to the good shepherd's voice for his rescue. And uh, you can look and see what the shepherd did for the lost sheep in the story. Number one, the shepherd noticed that the sheep was missing. He noticed that he was lost. And he cared deeply for that lost sheep. It is painful and disappointing when people don't notice that they are in sin and lost. That they don't realize that depression has gripped them. Discouragement has taken them over. But I'm going to tell you something. The good shepherd notices what's happening with the sheep. The shepherd then left the ninety and nine with the other shepherds. We see then the value of each person in the sight of God. Jesus left the splendor of heaven to search for us. Notice, can we look at Philippians 2, 5 through 11? In Philippians 2... 5 through 11, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it to be robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, taking the form of a servant and becoming and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and those in earth and of the things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
So the shepherd left his home in glory to come and seek us. We must be willing to leave the 90 and 9 to go after the 1. Now, that's not just talking to me. Friend, you are saved. There are people that are looking up to you. You can reach out to them. There's people right now that are in your circles that, you know, I kind of like what, what Google has done. They have what they call Google Circles. Now, there's people in your circles that's never going to meet me outside of you introducing us. Never going to meet Jesus outside of you introducing them to him. There's people in your circles that's never going to meet some wonderful people unless you introduce them. And you can do that. Amen? Now, so Jesus left. All right, then Jesus searched. You see, he came himself. He searched until he found the sheep. We see in the act the relentless pursuit of God, the perseverance of God to save us from our sins. How many of you are glad that God didn't give up on you? Huh? I'm so glad that when he looked for me, that he just, you know, he didn't look just one time and say, uh, well, too bad. I'm glad the first time that I felt led to come to the altar and I rejected, I'm glad he didn't quit drawing. The first sermon that I heard where I should have went that I wanted to, the first invitation I rejected, I, I'm glad he didn't just say, well, I'm never going to call him no more. I'm glad he continued to reach again. Then, notice uh, the shepherd carried. He put the sheep on his own shoulders. You see, this is a picture of the cross. Notice Isaiah 53 and 4. Isaiah 53 and 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Notice verse 12. In verse 12, therefore, he says, I'll divide him a portion with the great. And shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Listen, the shepherd carried our griefs. He carried our sin. He carried our sickness. And that's why he can say, cast all your cares on me, because I care for you. And last but not least, the shepherd rejoiced. Our salvation is God's greatest joy. You see, the night I got saved, it may not have made the headlines of the local newspaper in Phoenix City, Alabama, or Columbus, Georgia. Um, in today's world, it would not have been on Yahoo or Google's front page. It would not be, uh, you know, top news with Bing or any of these uh, MSNBC or CNN but on the golden streets of glory, the old song said, Hallelujahs rang. Are you with me? Because me getting saved, you getting saved, made news in heaven. And the Bible said when the, when, when the sheep was brought back, everybody rejoiced. When the coin was found, even though it was lost through carelessness, she called all of her friends and neighbors and said, that coin that I had lost, I have found, and everybody rejoiced. When the prodigal son came home, the Bible says that son that was lost has been found. That one that was dead is now alive. And he said, so it is in heaven when someone who is lost, watch this, this is what makes heaven rejoice. This is what makes heaven so happy. Not that we had a great song to sing. Not that we had a great message to preach. Not that we've got a great building to build. That's, that doesn't impress heaven a bit. He said, man, but when somebody gives their heart to Jesus, when a soul is snatched from the flames of hell, when he's pulled out of the devil's hand, when the devil had a trap set, a snare set, and he was surely to be lost forever, and because of your witness and my witness and because of his salvation, that soul now has changed destinies. The Bible said heaven absolutely throws a party. Listen, I just had a, just a quick revelation. You really want God to do something great in your life? You really want God to take notice of your prayers and your request? Win somebody to Jesus Christ. You, you, let your, you reach out and touch somebody. You invite somebody. You expose somebody to Jesus. Watch them get saved and watch what the Lord does in your life. He that winneth souls, Daniel said, 
is wise. Let's stand together. He that winneth souls is wise. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. Lord, I've had an awesome time tonight. Lord, I thank you, God, for helping us as we, we talk about the lost because truly, truly, everything we do should be about winning those who do not know Jesus Christ. Winning those who do not know Jesus Christ. Lord, I give you praise and honor for this that you're going to do among your people. Help us to go out now, Lord. Help us to leave here and realize that, that we've come to the filling station. We've come to get a message. We've come to get blessed, and we've been blessed. But now we enter into the harvest fields. And you said in your word, don't tell me that there's four months and then harvest. He said, for I'm telling you the fields right now are ready to be harvested. There's people right now that are ready to be reaped into the kingdom of God if we will just reach out, if we'll just get involved. God grant us that ability and that motivation to do it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Please remember... You're out a little bit early, so go look at the jobs.